This is Nursing Australia, proudly brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association. Hello and welcome to this special episode of Nursing Australia as we present the latest APNA webinar exploring the current COVID landscape in Australia. This exciting presentation is jam-packed with subject matter experts to ensure that you're in the know and most importantly, up to date and across all things COVID in Australia. APNA President Karen Booth gave an update as to how APNA is representing primary healthcare nurses. So we're looking at team care, better support, and actually a much more better uh, workflow for patient care, but also for the health team. Very special guest, Dr Ginny Mansberg presented a lay of the land, a state and territory update on all things COVID, vaccines, the disease burden, figures, numbers, treatments, and boosters. A lot of my patients at the moment, the latest thing that I'm hearing is, I'm not anti-vax, I'm waiting for Novavax, which is a little bit like I'm waiting for a rocket, I'm not gonna wait, for, I'm not gonna buy a car now, I'll wait for a rocket. And finally, our resident infection prevention and control expert, RN Sara Drew, provided practical guidance on VAX basics, management, and had some handy tips. So first of all, when we talk about vaccine eligibility, well, we do now know that as of Monday, everyone 12 years and above, it's recommended that they actually um, have a vaccine. So welcome to Nursing Australia Presents the current COVID landscape webinar. Let's kick things off with the latest in healthcare news. The vaccine divide worsens, fears 80% does not equal freedom, tobacco giants stand to profit off lung disease and the NMBA freezes registration fees. This is Nursing Australia News. Hello, I'm Mitch Wall. The vaccine divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is worsening. The latest federal government figures show Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are half as likely as other Australians to be fully vaccinated. Only 22% of the Indigenous population aged 16 and older are fully vaccinated compared with more than 42% of the general population. The creators behind the Marlborough Man, tobacco giant Philip Morris, have sparked outrage in medical circles over a bid to invest in company Vectra. The UK company develops inhaler technology, which are commonly used to treat lung illness in Australia, including COPD. Singapore continues to demonstrate that an 80% vaccination rate does not guarantee a return to pre-pandemic life. Infectious disease experts warn the milestone is not enough in the face of Delta, as relaxing of restrictions coincide with a spike in positive cases. Singapore has relied heavily on Pfizer and Moderna stocks, with only a small cohort of other residents opting for China's Sinovax. And in some good news, the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Australia has announced a freeze on nursing and midwife registrations for 2021-2022. The annual registration fee will remain at $180. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode. We now go to our special COVID presentation. We begin with introductions of the experts. We have with us uh, Karen Booth, President of APNA. Karen will be familiar to many APNA members who are with us tonight. And Karen's coming live to us from Broken Hill. We also have Dr Ginny Mansberg, who's a general practitioner and another familiar face who um, has graced our TV screens, giving lots of fantastic information to the public um, over the whole COVID pandemic period. And Ginny's a general practitioner in Sydney and is currently giving COVID vaccine as well. And we also have Sarah Drew, and Sarah works with me here at APNA. She's a registered nurse and a nurse immuniser and is also involved in rolling out vaccine in sunny Queensland. So we'll first head to Karen's update. Um, she's Karen has been uh, working as a registered nurse for forever. No, not really. And um, is an authorised nurse immuniser and as well as everything she does uh, for nurses on behalf of nurses um, with APNA. She also still works in general practice and is currently part of the surge workforce in Broken Hill. So thank you so much, Karen, for being with us tonight from afar and in a different time zone. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing the update on what's happening out there. Excellent, thanks. Hello everyone and I'm very um, pleased to be here and Broken Hill is a lovely place, my first visit here. I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of some of the things that are happening um, <clears throat> with APNA on your behalf and before we move on to um, Ginny's more formal presentation. 
A quick update, the 10-year primary healthcare plan is uh, coming hopefully to a, a close soon. We've had over 200 submissions and the team at the department has done an amazing job condensing that and bringing in the recommendations and looking at common themes. And we're actually now, um, some of you will have seen the recommendations that went to the minister and have been out for consultation. And underneath that 10 year plan, we're actually building the pillars that will support that 10 year plan. And when we look at what's in it for nurses, I think importantly, there's a lot in there for patients. So we're looking at team care, better support, and actually a much more better uh, workflow for patient care, but also for the health team. And we have the quadruple aim of um, efficiencies and cost, a better experience for patients, a better experience for, um, for health practitioners. <clears throat> and again, that, that wonderful team view of care. For nurses, Part of the recommendations from the plan will be that we have a 10-year primary healthcare nursing workforce plan with an embedded career pathway. And the, um, there are medical workforce strategy is almost complete. There's a recommendation for an allied workforce strategy as well. And we are almost in a crisis situation, I think, with this workforce planning where we have an ageing workforce, in particularly for primary care, and uh, we have the added stress of COVID, which is putting more stress on the workforce. So we really need to look at attracting young nurses, new nurses into primary health care and really much better supporting the nurses that we have there. The recommendations from the plan also talk about working to full scope of practice and that's for all health professionals, in particular for nurses. And then looking at extended skills, so there's a lot of discussion about nurse prescribing. There is a model that is um, sitting with, uh, with ANMAC and APRA looking at, at waiting for the next steps of, to how we get nurse prescribing um, approved over the next, you know, the next couple of years. There's also recommendations about better utilisation of nurse practitioner and midwife models of care. And from this work, we've also seen the, uh, the commencement of a 10-year um, strategy, a workforce strategy for nurse practitioners. And I think what will happen is that primary health care will actually drag along um, the nursing workforce um, planning in that we, we actually will start with nurse practitioners, then hopefully it'll pull, um, pull the other behind it. There's a recognition um, from the committee um, preparing the 10-year plan and from the department. We need parity um, with the public sector for nurses in primary health care, particularly for pay. And when there's a, a, an acute awareness that um, funding in relation to nurses um, uh, is, is underdone. So hopefully something good will come from that. A career pathway, we definitely need a career pathway and, uh, and we're looking at embedding the, um, our career pathway and the nursing and primary health care program into the next 10 years and how we develop in that space. And of course, an absolute need for student placements in primary health care so that students know all about primary health care. It's not just about hospitals, it's about keeping people well. How do you do prevention? How do you keep, um, keep the community out of hospital? And of course, a particular emphasis on shortages and workforce needs in rural settings. So next slide. Uh, lots of things happening with ACNA and we have representatives on the COVID-19 uh, clinical task force. Every week, uh, Suzanne or I or both of us turn up and meet with Michael Kidd and the peak bodies around the implementation of the COVID vaccine rollout. Uh, you know, some weeks are better than others in the conversations we have, but we actually... The information that you give us on the APNA COVID pulse check is crucial to um, making sure that we keep uh, 
keep the department aware of the issues that are happening with the rollout, the problems, the good things, you know, what's working well and what's not. So I think there's another pulse check that will head your way before the end of the year and will be really important that you, um, that you uh, tell us how, you, how you're going. There's a National Nursing Rural Journalist Pathway is being developed and that's new. And our first meeting for that uh, committee will start next week. All of the primary health care um, peak bodies and, uh, and key nursing um, stakeholders will be involved. The 10-year nurse practitioner workforce plan has commenced. That first meeting was uh, last week and uh, it will involve uh, nursing groups and as well as uh, medical groups and health workforce. Very good first meeting, very positive fail um, after that meeting. Things that are recommended, I've already talked about the primary healthcare nursing workforce plan. We absolutely desperately need uh, a national nursing workforce plan. There was initial work done on that um, it's been a couple of years now since we had the educating, educating the nurse of the future um, uh, consultations, and that report is there ready with recommendations to go. But we just, um, because COVID has delayed uh, the starting of a workforce plan, we're now looking at uh, shortages, um, stress from the workforce with COVID, so absolutely need that. Uh, war Games, I participated in War Games with uh, Lieutenant General Fruin, uh, as did a number of the peak bodies a few months ago. And there is actually a paper published, there's a link there that has uh, all of the, uh, there's a traffic light system for who can give vaccines in what state autonomous supported. So a very good plan and uh, good to see that nurses from around the country are, uh, you know, in vaccine teams from different states doing things in different states and supporting, supporting the efforts. And the APNA Workforce Survey is coming and we need you. This is absolutely crucial. This will help us plan for the primary healthcare nursing workforce plan. The Institute of Health and Welfare, we have a, a, a uh, relationship with them, we supply a lot of the national data for primary health care nursing. There's not a lot connected, uh, collected through other sources, through many uh, MBS is um, difficult to assess activity of nurses. So what we do is important. Thanks very much. Thanks oh. so much, Karen. That was a great update. And um, we're a uh, APNA definitely needs input from all the nurses with boots on the ground to make sure your voices are heard at a government level. So, so thank you so much for that. And we're going to go to Ginny now um, to give, an, give us an update on how the states and territories are faring and what's happening with vaccine efficacy. G'day everyone, I'm Ginny and I'm coming for you, for, to you from the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation. Thanks for having me on a Wednesday night. Let's get straight into it. Um, a lot of you guys are following Twitter, following the news. You've seen all these numbers. I have put one down new for Queensland today. In fact, that was in hotel quarantine. So Queensland is looking pretty strong at the moment. And those of us in New South Wales, well, we're still in lockdown and hoping to get out of it sometime in October. Um, Let's look at the vaccination rate. So I pulled these up. These are the, two, uh, the September 2014 numbers. But I reckon they're pretty good all round. Um, and while people are, you know, chucking darts at Queenslanders, they're not too far behind. Um, uh, New South Wales is just basically throwing money around and getting every nurse out of um, primary care and out of emergency departments where they're needed to make them staff the uh, vaccine hubs. But... The numbers are looking pretty good and from um, it's not a race to wow, we're, we're doing pretty well at sprinters. Um, I'm pretty happy with those numbers. Okay, I put this, <laughs> this slide in. I almost think it's a bit of a joke. Where can we go? Not very many places. I'm in Sydney um, and so pretty much I'm not coming to see any of you and I'm not even allowed five kilometres from home unless I have a special permit to go to work. Um, so I'm certainly not even getting into rural New South Wales, but 
the borders are pretty slammed shut um, at the moment. And even if you can get in, for example, into Queensland, one of my besties is uh, had to fly into Sydney for a job. Uh, she was booked to go back to Queensland. There are no hotel quarantine rooms available. There's one flight a day. It's booked out uh, uh, for the yeah, in, for the foreseeable future, and she's stuck here in Sydney waiting to get home. So, um, not you're not going away uh, on holidays unless you're lucky enough to live in WA or Tassie. Let's um, look at overseas. Forget it. Um, we've suspended all flights to New Zealand, unfortunately, and. They, Qantas did announce that they're going to resume flights into Sydney from the US uh, from December this year, which is awesome. I'm really, really happy about that, mainly because I've got two kids who live in the States. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty because everybody's trying to say to us, is Delta truly a worse, vaccine, a worse virus than we had with the Wuhan strain, with the uh, so-called alpha strain, and uh, which was the UK strain. Well, we do have data from Canada, and it does look like it is worse. So it does look like you're 105% more likely to be hospitalised, but 241% more likely to be uh, admitted to ICU and 121% more likely to die from the disease. We've got some um, data from the CDC and prevention in, um, uh, in the US. And this was actually from a wedding in County, Massachusetts, where people were actually vaccinated. However, there was a big spread. It was a super spreader event from a wedding that happened there. And what they found was that vaccinated people were less likely to become infected than those who were um, unvaccinated. However, if they did get the infection, they were as likely to have high levels of the virus in their oro and nasopharynx as those who were unvaccinated. So if you can think about your immune system, it needs to come out swinging from every single angle at full power when it first meets a virus. And then it can't continue to do that for every single virus it ever meets. So it needs to basically go into a reserve mode. So it's got its reserves there that can scale up pretty quickly if it remakes the virus, but it needs to conserve some energy. And one of the places it conserves energy from is the IgA which is the type of the uh, antibodies that live in your oropharynx. It also lives in your guts, and they very quickly meet um, any virus uh, that's coming uh, that person's way. Well, those IgA levels seem to be a lot lower, and that's why you have quite high levels of um, virus in your oropharynx and nasopharynx, even if you are vaccinated. That means that you can probably pass it on to others. Uh, so let's go through the vaccines because this is really what you're here to discuss tonight. So let's start with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I'm sure pretty much everybody who is here tonight has been giving. Uh, it's also known as a Vaxzevria. Uh, that's mainly we're trying to call them by their vaccine names because the AstraZeneca va um, brand has been so tarnished. So we have two sets of data. We've got efficacy data and effectiveness data. And I'm sure so many of you know the difference, but the efficacy data is in the original trials, the phase two and three trials that are submitted to groups like the TGA to get approval. But then there are these post surveillance uh, data. We continue to uh, monitor all vaccines and medications as they come onto the market. And we collect that data and that's real world data. So we don't control for as many extraneous variables. And that's where we find out about a whole lot of things like the TTS, um, that thrombocytopenia um, syndrome. Uh, and that's where we found that at around one in uh, 50,000 uh, people. So the effectiveness data is the real world data from those phase four uh, phases of the trial. So we've got really two good sets of data. One is from Public Health England. Now they have yet to um, submit this for peer review and it's not been published. But at this point, what we know is that um, at one dose, it's about 33.5% effective. But after two doses, it's about 60% effective against symptomatic disease, but 93% effective against hospitalisation, which is where we really um, are trying to, to get effect. And it's been really effective here in New South Wales as well. We've got some other data from the NEJM. This has been published and peer reviewed. Very, very similar numbers there, but slightly less effective against severe disease. Let's have a look at the Cominati vaccine, which I'm sure a lot of you are, are delivering as well. So again, uh, this is Delta-specific data out of Pfizer. 
Oh, NEJM is the New England Journal of Medicine. It's one of the big four most prestigious medical journals. And what medical journals do is when they submit, when you submit a study as an author of a study, they will submit that data to the peer review process, which means that there's a whole scientific board that will go through your numbers and everything that you say in your study with a fine tooth comb looking for errors and they won't publish it till they pick up your errors. So in theory, a really high level journal like the NEJM or the British Medical Journal or the Lancet or the Journal of the American Medical Association, they're the big four, they would be very high quality trials. We really rely on those a lot. Let's go back to that Public Health England data. Again, it's not peer reviewed, but what we found with a single dose of the Comirnaty vaccine is about 33.5% effective against getting the disease, 88% effective after two doses with 96% efficacy um, against hospitalisation. Again, that same New England Journal of Medicine data uh, found that about 36% effective after one dose, but again, slightly less effective against severe disease. We had some more data that's been released from Israel. The reason why Israel data is only from Pfizer is because that is the only vaccine that they are using. They had widespread vaccination from as early as January. And that's why a lot, a lot of their people are actually, their immunity is really waning. But their data suggested 90% effective against severe disease, very similar. Um, and against, uh, and about 85 to 90% against symptomatic disease, but only 39% against infection. Now, with uh, so in terms of these, these were all done three weeks apart. These were all of these were three weeks apart. These two commonality vaccines. The reason why the 39% is relevant is that if you have a largely unvaccinated community, and don't forget in Israel they've only managed to get up to about 60% vaccinated. You've got 40% of the community who are unvaccinated. If you remember back to that Boston wedding, that Massachusetts wedding, the people who are getting breakthrough infections who've been vaccinated have got very high levels of virus in their nasopharynx and their oropharynx. So at that point, what we're worried about is they can still uh, infect people who are unvaccinated who've got a very high rate of hospitalisation. So that is still very relevant because there are still breakthrough infections. Let's have a look at the Moderna, also known as the Spike Vax vaccine, which we keep getting told is about to be rolled out any minute now from a pharmacy near you. And some of you guys might be employed in those pharmacies to actually give them. So we've got some unpublished um, Canadian uh, non-peer reviewed data, which shows that this spike vax vaccine is 56% effective after one dose against getting the disease with 87% effectiveness against symptomatic disease after two doses. The Morbidity Mortality Report Weekly, that comes out of the Centers for Disease Control in America. That is not peer reviewed, but it's at a very high government level in America. And what they show, they looked at some data in nursing home residents who generally have a much lower immune system ability to uh, protect themselves. We see this with flu, that where sometimes in, in nursing homes, the effect, effectiveness is only 10 to 30% because we don't get great, amazing immune system responses from older people. But it was still 53.1% effective against getting any disease in nursing home residents because they were being screened often with PCR testing so we could really have a good sense of what was going on as opposed to other uh, study centres where we're waiting for people to come forward and present with symptoms. Let's go to our last uh, study, our last vaccine, which is the Novavax, which is the Covavax vaccine. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, we've still got clinical trials coming. I wanted to put this in because it's really easy to poo-poo the Novavax vaccine. As you know, it's a protein subunit with the nanoparticles in it. Um, a lot of my patients at the moment, the latest thing that I'm hearing is I'm not anti-vax, I'm waiting for Novavax, which is a little bit like I'm waiting for a rocket. I'm not going to wait. For, I'm not going to buy a car now. I'll wait for a rocket. It is coming. Um, we've still bought 51 million doses of them um, for us in Australia. The thing is that we don't still have the clinical trials. There is no data about um, Delta at all. They have not applied anywhere. Um, so uh, what we're waiting for with COVID, uh, the Covavax is that we are waiting for the data to come forward, particularly for Delta. We have some earlier uh, vaccine data um, against the Wuhan strain, but we don't have Delta data mainly because it's not used anywhere. Let's talk about boosters. Um, I think this is on everybody's lips. Um, everybody um, in Israel aged 40 and over 
uh, are getting boosters at the moment, regardless of their other disease uh, profile. So whether or not they have diabetes or anything that's going to put them at high risk of entering intensive care and needing intubation and being at a high risk of death, all people over the age of 40 are getting it in Israel. The UK and France have just started. I think Boris Johnson um, announced it yesterday. Uh, Macron announced it two days ago. Germany has announced that it is going to start. I think it will happen in the next uh, month. And the CDC has also announced booster shots for all Americans, um, regardless of their immune system status or their risk, as of um, September the 20th, and that will be eight months after the individual second dose. What we don't know is who best benefits from um, a booster, how soon after the second dose should it be given? There's a lot of this that we don't know. And in some ways, Israel has volunteered to be, I guess, a case, a, a study for the rest of the world. And we're going to see very similar with the UK, France and, um, and the US as well. And Germany will be starting as well. We don't know what's going to happen in Australia yet. We're watching what happens in other countries. We are not yet at the two-dose vaccinated, uh, two vaccinated state. Um, but... What has been announced is that we have ordered that 60 million Pfizer and 50 million Moderna vaccines on top of the Novavax, which are due to be delivered in 2022-2023, uh, presumably mostly as boosters. We do know that Novavax is also has in trial a combo COVID-19 flu vaccine. I don't know whether any of you saw that the Immunisation Coalition, um, of which I am a director, we put out some advice that there is no need to separate the flu vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccines. They're, uh, they're being co-administered around the world, so uh, there didn't seem to be any problem with that, and now there is a single uh, vaccine that's being trialled. We do need to think about what's happening in poorer nations. At this point in places like, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, we don't think there are huge amounts of COVID there yet, but that's obviously a place that there is a risk of having a mutation, which is what happened in India, obviously, when we had the Delta strain. Let's have a look at adverse effects, which you guys are ask, answering questions about this on a daily basis. So, of course, everybody's saying to you, I don't want the one that gives me a blood clot. So let's have a look at what the risk of those dangerous, unusual uh, thrombocytopenic blood clots are. So what we know is that for every um, 100,000 people under the age of 50 who get it, it'll be 3.1 cases per um, AstraZeneca vaccine here in uh, New South Wales because of the high risk of um, contracting the, uh, the disease. Here and in uh, Melbourne as well, we've got a high rate of uptake of AstraZeneca at both pharmacies and in general practice. Um, and we have to go through these risks with our patients. And that just goes up to um, the lowest risk is actually between the ages of 60 and 70, where it's 1.4 per 100,000 people. Here in Australia, to be called a TTS, you need two out of three um, of the, the symptoms. Um, it needs to be a thrombocytopenia, where a lot of our patients just walk around with low platelet levels anyway. A normal platelet count is 150 and above. It only becomes relevant clinically where you start having problems with bleeding if you're below 50. And a lot of people walk around with a platelet count of 140, 130. That was enough to qualify you if you got that and a, and a bog standard DVT. So we know that we're probably overcalling the risk here in Australia. We know that. Um, and it doesn't matter. These are the risks that we have to tell our patients. Um, as of uh, 5th of September, uh, in Australia, we had given 10.2 million doses of AstraZeneca. We've got 132 cases of those, only 50 are the tier one where we really think they are likely to be those TTS. And so far we've had eight deaths, six of them in women. So that is less than one in a million. And there are a lot greater risks out there in medicine. As you guys know, um, you are giving vaccines all the time. And we know that there are risks, certainly in theatre, getting um, your boobs done and having um, a, a, an anaesthetic. There are lots of risks and this is a pretty low risk, but our patients are absolutely terrified of it. Uh, let's talk about what the contraindications are for the AstraZeneca's for over 60s. Um, it's if there has been, you've had one of these TTSs in the brain or in the spleen, if you've had an heparin induced thrombocytopenia in, in any time in your life, and if you've got antiphospholipid syndrome with thrombosis. Having said all of which, if we are going to tell our patients who are absolutely terrified, 
that they cannot have an AstraZeneca, even if what they, they're prepared to get Pfizer and they're not prepared to get an AstraZeneca vaccine. Well, certainly today the Immunisation Coalition has actually called to make all vaccines available to all people just because it's more important that we get the vaccination right um, level up. And as supply constraints go down, it's just going to be more important that we just get our numbers up. Let's go through the um, adverse effects of uh, the mRNA vaccines. We're going to put them together because it looks like the rates of the myocarditis, pericarditis is very similar between the commonality and the spike vax vaccines. It's a particular issue for males under the age of 30. It's most likely to happen after the second dose. So about 76% happen after the second dose. One, one to five days after the administration of the vaccine with a mean of two. It doesn't happen an hour later. So anybody who you've administered the vaccine to and they're sitting in the waiting room because you've told them to wait for 15 or 20 minutes and they report to you that they have chest pain and shortness of breath or palpitations, we have to take it seriously, but it's extremely unlikely to be symptoms attributable to the vaccine and more likely to be something like panic. But still, you guys are on the front line. You guys are going to be dealing with these patients day in, day out. And if my clinic is anything to go by, there are a lot of them who are very, very worried. Uh, we've so far got 84 cases that have been reported to the TGA. Um, but we know that it's around about the rate that we're expecting anyway. And so we think that a lot of these cases are probably not attributable to the vaccine, but we're just not sure and we have to investigate it. Uh, Atagi has said that if this happens, what you need to do is you need to do a troponin level. And of course, if that's high, that is suggestive of myocarditis. We have to do an ECG and there are very non-specific ST or T wave abnormalities that is where you will come in because you are the guys doing those ECGs. They've also um, suggested that we do chest X-rays. They're not easily accessible within the primary care environment. And of course, they haven't really told us how to interpret those chest X-rays, but I guess in some context, we need to make sure that we're not just assuming that all things are related to the common RD um, vaccine, that somebody doesn't have, let's say something like a pneumothorax and we're just dismissing it as, a, um, as related to the vaccine. I did want to point out a very large US study um, because they have such high rates of actual COVID in the 12 to 17 year old um, age group. And this is the group that has the highest risk of the myocarditis and pericarditis. The risk if they do get COVID is 450 cases per million. Now, if you compare that um, to what we think is about 16 per million from the vaccine, it's a much higher risk if they get COVID. And I think those numbers are really reassuring to parents because you will be dealing with the parents who are really terrified. They're terrified of the COVID, but they're also terrified of this vaccine. So we could tell them that they're six times more likely to get this same heart problem from COVID than from the vaccine. Let's talk about ivermectin. Um, this is really, really topical. So contrary to what you might believe um, or might hear online from your patients, studies have shown that it is ineffective. The doses at which it is promoted by influencers on Instagram and on TikTok are very high doses and are super therapeutic doses, which induce severe side effects. And it's not just nausea and vomiting, it includes seizures and coma. The TGA has expressly stated that they should not be used. And in fact, they have just been told that we are no longer allowed to give um, ivermectin in, um, off, off label. We are not allowed to do that anymore. We've seen a three to four fold uh, increase in dispensing of ivermectin, which I'm devastated about because that just means that my GP colleagues are actually prescribing it um, in spite of the data that we have um, that it doesn't work. The biggest study that was found um, that found 90% efficacy of ivermectin against severe COVID-19 disease um, has actually been found to be fraudulent. And in fact, the studies that are not fraudulent show no benefit from ivermectin at all. Uh, that doesn't mean that the studies are going to end. We will continue to study it. But at this point, what we know is uh, the studies that have show that it's ineffective, the drug has severe side effects, and there are still people who need it and they can't get it at the moment, there is a severe shortage in Australia. So um, I think we can just, for now, just say, please, no, no ivermectin, don't even talk about it. And the other one that's really um, 
uh, super topical is citrovimab because it just got approved here in Australia. So it's a novel IV monoclonal antibody. I think we all learned about monoclonal antibodies when um, young Donald Trump went and got himself some in the uh, military hospital over in the States um, when he got COVID. But actually, it does work. And in particular, citrovimab has actually been found to reduce hospitalisation and death by 79% in adults as long as they take it when they have mild to moderate COVID-19, as long as it's early, and particularly in uh, based on the Comet and ICE trial, it's a particular trial, uh, we know that it needs to be given within five days of the um, onset of symptoms in patients who do not require oxygen, and they need to have at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19, and I've listed them on the screen there. If you have patients that meet those criteria uh, and know if there is no evidence, this has to be given for um, adults, not for children. Um, so uh, only adults at this point. But if you have a, an adult um, who is uh, within five days of symptom onset, who is not requiring oxygen, and sometimes, you know, we were seeing with COVID-19, there's a lot of patients who don't seem breathless, but you'll put a pulse oximeter on them and their oxygen saturation is 60 and you'll freak out. But I would say that those patients do need oxygen. So these need to be patients who've got reasonably okay oxygen levels and um, they need to have one risk um, of severe disease progression. At this point, we don't know how it's gonna be given because it's gotta be given IV and a lot of us don't have the infrastructure in our practices to actually give um, IV medications, but it might well happen. Um, I don't know if you guys have done um, cannulation courses, if you're sort of giving iron, um, iron infusions or anything like that, you might have the infrastructure there and then you'll be doing, um, I imagine, quite a bit of it, particularly if you're in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Let's go to our last slide. I'm trying to race through these because I'm in the interest of time, um, but we are taking questions. So just make sure you pop everything in the chat or in the Q&A section. Let's just go through, through, uh, quickly through the uh, no fault indemnity scheme, um, which yes, it only came into play on the 6th of September, but it has been backdated to February this year. Um, it's going, the, the government is going to cover you for basically any injuries over $5,000 that have been proven to be an adverse reaction to a TGA authorised COVID vaccine. Um, so obviously, if you, um, it has to be TGA authorised. So, for example, if you are giving uh, somebody a Pfizer vaccine who is 75 and they don't have a good reason for that, you've got to be really, really careful. Okay, that's it from me. I'm going to hand you over to the amazing Sarah. Um, thanks so much, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you. That was a lot of information, but, you know, everything that we really needed to hear. Thank you so much, Ginny. And Sarah, for everything that we need to know um, with our boots on the ground in our practices and clinics. Thanks, Suzanne. So first of all, I'd like to just start by acknowledging everyone that's in the room today. Um, I know for myself who works in a COVID clinic, it's exhausting at the moment. Um, we're losing staff left, right and centre to hubs, um, but thank you to everyone for everything that you're doing. So what I'm going to do, try and do in the next 15 minutes is just quickly brush through some basics around the vaccines um, and some information that we've you know, been privy to. We've tried to address the next few slides based on what we're hearing through our app and the Facebook questions, what we've got coming through our um, support lines, just to make sure that you know, you've got the most up-to-date information. We do have a variation of people that are in the room tonight and those that haven't started yet administering vaccine to those that have been doing it for, I think we're going into our seventh month now. Um, and so there'll be little bits and pieces for everyone in the next few slides. So first of all, when we talk about vaccine eligibility, well, we do now know that as of Monday, everyone 12 years and above, it's recommended that they actually um, have a vaccine. Now, as Jenny's already mentioned tonight, that does differ by state and territory around eligibility. Uh, in theory, 12 to 59 is the Pfizer or the soon to be in the market Moderna vaccine, and then 60 and above is the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, in saying that, we do know that we have a number of states and territories that have actually changed the eligibility based on their COVID-19 situation, their vaccine supply and uptake. And Queensland was the latest one today to throw a spanner into that works, whereby now 
if you are in a, yeah, as of Saturday, sorry, not now, as of Saturday this week, that if you're wanting to have a Pfizer vaccine and you're 60 or above, you can just turn up from Saturday to um, one of the hubs. Our advice there is please just follow your state and territory Department of Health guidelines and stay up to date with them. And certainly we'll have a few links in the end of the presentation this evening that you can access to keep up to date with these. In saying that, at 4.38 this evening, Suzanne very cleverly managed to get from the National COVID uh, Vaccine Task Force a statement around state and territory eligibility. And you can see in front of you there that it says that the National COVID Task Force is aware that some jurisdictions have expanded their eligibility further to than that of the national eligibility criteria. They've basically done this to simplify eligibility. And if practices, general practices, pharmacy, wherever you're working, have the capacity and the available stock that you can take additional bookings based on your state or territory eligibility criteria. So for example, if you're in Queensland from Saturday, if you do have the stock and the capacity to offer Pfizer to patients that are 60 years and over, you can go ahead with that. In saying that, you still need to prioritise those phase one populations. Um, so we know that they're the aged care workers, they're healthcare workers, there are average on Torres Strait Islander people aged 12 and over, um, and anyone with that underlying health conditions. So they still do need to be uh, prioritised in this situation. But certainly, um, as Ginny said, with the IC's recommendation today, it looks like more of states and territories are coming in line with that. So what I'm going to just briefly do now is just go through some basics of the vaccines because there seems to be a lot of confusion. And I can see already in the chat, there's people questioning how many doses they're actually getting out of a vial of vaccine. So we're going to start with Cominati or our Pfizer vaccine. And as Jimmy said, we're trying to move to the names of the vaccines and away from the brand. So it is registered for people aged 12 years and over. It comes in a multi-dose vial that contains six vaccines. Oh, six doses of vaccine, sorry. The thawed suspension is 0.45 mils. And I must admit, based on the question, one of the questions put in the chat already, I had a situation where after drawing probably 3,000 vaccines of Pfizer, I, for some reason, had a seventh dose. And I actually questioned whether or not I had reconstituted or you know, added too much of the sodium chloride, what it was. And ever since then, whenever I get a vial out, I actually measure against another one. Um, it's just sort of a habit I've got into to double check myself, as well as obviously having that checked with a, another colleague. So the solution is a white to off-white opaque um, solution that does have undissolved particles in it. Once the unopened thawed multi-dose vial um, has been, uh, sorry, an unopened dose, can be stored between two and eight degrees. And most of you on the, the webinar tonight will actually be receiving these as thawed. Now it's a maximum of 31 days from its defrost date. So that will be clearly labeled um, when you receive your, um, your delivery. The multi-dose vial must be diluted with only 1.8 mils of sodium chloride for injection. And so you need to be checking that that is the 1.8. Uh, we don't shake any of these vials. We just uh, actually, before you dilute, you invert 10 times, you add your sodium chloride to your uh, vial, and then you invert again another 10 times. The solution then will be off-white in colour, but there should be no visible particles left in that. What you'll end up with is a 2.25 mil of vaccine. Now, in theory, this is six 0 0.3 mil doses, which would leave, in theory, 0.45 mils of vaccine in your vial. Now, we do know that based on all of the training that we are um, following, and hopefully everyone is keeping up to date with that, it's uh, a little overwhelming sometimes when you get two or three emails in a day saying that there's been changes made to the department training, but we are using low dead volume needles and syringes. Now, this does obviously help with accuracy in the sense of um, less wastage, but certainly, the recommendation is, is that you are drawing off six accurate doses. And the, you know, the word accurate is the, the part that I need to hone in on here 
you need to make sure that they are full doses that you are administering. If you do have that small amount left in the vial, that is not an issue. Um, and as I say, I've never been able to, other than this once when I really did question what I'd done, but I have never been able to get an extra 0.3 mil um, out of any Pfizer vial uh, ever since the day that I did that one. So the vaccine should be stored at room um, temperature before it's administered. So you're taking it out of the fridge. The recommendation is not to be giving these cold because obviously that can cause in increased pain at the injection site. It is administered as an IM injection, preferably into the deltoid with a two dose schedule, three weeks or 21 days apart. Now there is, um, the, I'm gonna say opportunity, that's the wrong word. The vaccine can be administered at a minimum of 14 days. It's not recommended. Um, but to complete the two doses is within the six weeks. Now, if you've got someone that has one dose as I've had, and they've decided that they didn't want to have the second dose, they just cancelled their appointment. Obviously, we followed them up. We had a conversation with them. Um, there is no maximum time between doses. So that patient actually came back at seven weeks. So thankfully, we got them back, and now they're considered fully vaccinated. Um, another question that we get a lot, uh, particularly with the visor vials, is how do I store them? They arrive in a foam tray. That foam tray is what protects them from light. And so you are to leave them in that foam tray until such point that you are ready to reconstitute or to um, dilute and uh, administer those vaccines. So spike vax or the Moderna vaccine. This, as we've already heard, is predominantly initially going to be rolled out through pharmacies. And we probably won't see it in any general practices until um, moving into 2022. But it too is a multi-dose vial. It is a 0.5 mil vaccine. So the multi-dose vial, again, has 10 doses per vial. The packs that you will get will come in a 10 vial, so 100 doses per pack. So it is a sterile white to off-white suspension, but it also might contain some translucent product. Um, it is ready to use formulation, so you do not need to dilute it in any way, shape or form. However, the unopened thawed vials can only be stored between two and eight for a maximum of 30 days from the thaw date. And again, this carton is similar to that of an AstraZeneca carton. And so it will be um, on that packaging, it will state there what your um, thaw date is. And so it's 30 days from that thaw date, not from the date you're receiving. Again, we don't shake these vials. Instead, we actually swirl the content gently in between each withdrawal of vaccine. It is administered again. I am preferably in the deltoid. It's a two-dose schedule. This, however, is a four to six-week schedule. So um, zero and 28 days, but it can be up to six weeks. Again, a minimum of 14 days, but not preferred. And again, no maximum interval in between. And the difference between your Pfizer vaccine and your spike vax is the recommendation is a one mil syringe for your Pfizer vaccine. However, it's a two or three mil syringe given that the dose is 0 0.5 mils. So um, the, the recommendation from the government is that we go with the two or three mil syringe um, in this instance. Just a little bit about cold chain of our mRNA vaccines. One thing that we are hearing is that there's um, some breaches in the cold chain management of the vaccines. So like all our vaccines that we have, we must use our Strive for Five guidelines. It is the Bible of vaccine management. It is the, you know, the document that we go to for everything. So please make sure that you're up to date with what those guidelines state. The other thing to talk to um, with our mRNA vaccines is that once they are open, so once you open a multi-dose vial, it needs to be used within six hours. And that six hours is if it's being kept between two and eight degrees, okay? So ATAGI's recommendations are that any pre-drawn pre doses are, that are kept at room temperature are used within an hour. And any pre-drawn doses that are kept in cold chain, so between your two and eight degrees, can be used within six hours. And it's the same for both vaccines. 
some of the training is a little bit confusing around storage and um, temperatures, but ATAGI has recommended that they are both exactly the same. So as I've mentioned already, COVID vaccines should be stored in their original cartons. And this is done to protect them from light and to avoid any unnecessary exposure to light. So even with your um, doses, once you've got them drawn up, now with the Pfizer vaccine, you generally speaking, most practices I speak to are drawing off all six at once. You would then put them into an opaque labelled, or you'd label your syringe as to what the vaccine is. You would then put those into an opaque labelled container in regards to the vaccine, the batch number, the time it was removed from the cold chain and the time to discard. Um, if you're not, so in the instance of a Moderna um, or the spike vac vaccine, and you're drawing off each time you use it, or let's say you're doing an outreach clinic, what you would do is um, you will label your vial um, and then you will put it back into your um, cold chain management. Also, just something that um, a little tip that a lot of people seem to be missing is with any of the outer packaging, um, so the boxes that you have in particular for um, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, you do need to deface um, one side of the packaging by striking through uh, with a Sharpie or something similar to that. So just make sure that before you discard the boxes that you are actually doing that. On to the AstraZeneca or the Vaxavira vaccine. So we do know that it's registered in Australia by the TGA for use in people over the age of 18. However, it is recommended that Pfizer and Moderna are the preferred vaccine over AstraZeneca in adults under 60. Obviously, in an outbreak setting, we're seeing different um, scenarios with the AstraZeneca. So in the context of an outbreak where supply of Pfizer or Moderna are constrained, it is suggested that adults younger than 60 who do not have immediate access to Pfizer or Moderna can at or should assess their, the risks and benefits of them and their contacts from being vaccinated with Astra versus the rare risk of the serious effects. So we are seeing, particularly in Victoria, a lot more people have come out to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. So you just need to make sure that your patients are fully informed of the risks and benefits and that you, know, you do have informed consent. So the Astra vaccine is a multi-dose vial, as we know. The ones we're seeing in Australia now are a five mil vaccine, which equates to 10 mils of the 0.5 mil. So again, um, using a two or three mil syringe. Each patch pack contains 10 vials. So like your, your Moderna, 100 doses. And the recommended dose interval is 12 weeks, except during an outbreak setting, in which the preferred interval is between four and eight weeks. Now, currently, Victoria is doing six weeks for both their Pfizer and their AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, we did hear today that uh, the rumour is that they will be putting Pfizer back to three-week interval because supply is increasing, but Astra will be staying at the six-week interval. So people are able to, if they haven't made changes to their appointments, they are able to do that. Um, and similarly, New South Wales has been, has reduced uh, the interval with the Astra vaccine. If you do have someone that's under the age of 18 present for vaccination, they should not be given um, AstraZeneca vaccine at all. Um, in regards to cold chain of your Astra vaccine, unopened vials should be stored between two and eight, and they can be stored for up to six months. Now, for those of you that started doing COVID vaccines back in March, if you haven't used all of your Vaxavira, then you'll be getting some of those that are coming up for expiry. So you need to be checking your expiry dates very carefully. An unopened, uh, sorry, an open file of the Vaxavira vaccine can actually be stored for 48 hours total time in a cold chain storage. So that's again between two and eight. So you can actually be taking that out and taking doses of it over the, the 48 hours, but it is cumulative time, just remember that. Um, similarly, 
when it comes to uh, your Astra vaccine, make sure that once you open that vial, you are writing in the white space on the vial your date and time of opening and then time of discarding. Again, you can see there that pre-drawn vaccine should be administered immediately after drawn up or within one hour if stored at room temperature and six hours if stored in the cold chain. So you can draw all 10 doses if you have a full clinic and you can actually store that in the fridge in your opaque container. So just a little bit now on vaccine switch. So the reality is, is that we actually don't currently have any data on interchangeability between brands of COVID vaccines. And ATAGI recommends completing the vaccine course with the same vaccine. Where we have mixed schedules or using two different vaccines to complete the primary vaccination course, this is only recommended in special circumstances, such as those where we've had a serious vaccine attributed um, adverse event after the first dose of a vaccine, and in those cases where we might have people come back from overseas that are only partially vaccinated. And that brand that they've been vaccinated with overseas is not available in Australia. Now, in that incidence, if you do have that happen, a third dose of COVID-19 vaccine does not need to be given if a different brand is used for both doses. So you can see there, I've listed off currently the vaccines that are recognised in Australia. Now, in saying that, there is six vaccines there. Um, the ones that are in bold, so our Comirnaty, Pfizer vaccine, our Vaxavira, which is the AstraZeneca, and our Spikevax, Moderna, are the only ones that you can currently enter into the register, into AIR. Now, we do understand that changes are coming and that that's being worked on, but currently they are the only ones that you can enter. Um, and so if they've had something different overseas, the suggestion is, is that you um, take a copy of um, what they have had overseas, add it into your notes, and just keep a note so that once um, it becomes uh, air is expanded to be able to include these, you'll be able to do so and enter that for the patient. Just in regards to the um, digital certificates that a lot of patients are asking for, air has two options here. So currently you can't get a digital certificate if um, you have had two different vaccines, uh, or if you've had one overseas that's not recognised in Australia. However, uh, or if you've had a vaccine switch, so if you've had an adverse event where you may have had Astra and then you've had a Pfizer vaccine, it's still not recognising that. In that instance, people can use their immunisation history statement, uh, which will cover, like I say, if they've had one COVID vaccine, if they've had a different COVID vaccine overseas to what they've had here, or if the intervals that have been recommended by a target have not been met, so one dose is not being recognised. So the, the statement is okay for that. Or for those that have received two doses of the same vaccine, they will get issued a COVID-19 certificate, which seems to be taking a couple of days once they've received that second dose now. Just very quickly, something on off-site clinics. We're getting a lot of inquiries around this. Uh, so the Australian government does support general practices, hubs and art shows undertaking off-site clinics. That might include pop-up clinics, drive-through clinics or outreach. Um, just be aware, though, if you are going to do any drive-through clinics uh, and, and you're going to establish these with your clinic, that sites are required to sign a drive-through declaration with CBAS. And so if that's something that you're interested in, you just need to contact your primary health network. Uh, and just a reminder that you need to make sure in all the clinics that you're doing that you're meeting the site requirements um, that are set out by the department. Just in regards to continuing other vaccines during an outbreak, we know that immunisation is an essential service during COVID-19. And to date, thankfully, most childhood and other vaccines have been um, maintained. But make sure that if you're looking at doing any of these other types of clinics, that you've got you know, these three systems in place. You make sure you've got all your policies and procedures in place. You need to make sure your infection prevention and control practices are up to date. You need to consider your workforce and your administrative administration processes. You know, how are you doing that? Have you got pet staff that are sitting in, in rooms um, where they're taking calls and making appointments? What does it all look like? What's the best site set up for you? Is it an outdoor area with a gazebo? Do you need to have additional workflow processes in place or signage in your clinic so you've got that one-way flow? Um, 
and just making sure that you are still meeting the requirements around screening and post-vax observation. You can see there that's just an example of a, uh, an outside clinic that a practice is doing with some stickers um, in the way that they use to identify dose ones and dose twos of different vaccines, the time that the dose is given and the time that the, the patient can leave. So have a think about what are the options that you can set up and certainly APNA and the Infection Prevention Helpline are able to support that with you um, and give you some guidance. Just in regards to um, other vaccines during COVID, we just need to make sure too that you're aware that ATAGI did release some guidelines on um, observation, the 15 minute observation period, if social distancing is not possible in your clinic you may be able to reduce the post-vaccination observation period to five minutes. But patients need to be able to meet those six criteria in those boxes. And so ultimately, and best practice still remains the 15 minutes observation, but we don't want patients missing out on their other vaccines, particularly in the midst of the outbreaks. And so making sure that, you know, you understand these protocols and that you've got them in place so you can maintain that. Do you change you know, your clinic around so that you're doing childhood vaccines you know, between eight and 10 on Tuesday and Thursday where you've got no other patients in there? So just some things to think about. Uh, just briefly, this slide just talks to community pharmacies in the different states and territories and thanks to NCS for the data. Um, but you can see here that um, which vaccines are approved in the different states and territories and the ages. And the top one there looks a little bit strange because it says 88 CT can use all TGA approved vaccines and it says 10 plus. 10 plus is if the vaccines should be approved to be used under 12 years of age, the minimum age that ACT will be able to deliver vaccine for is still 10. So they won't be able to do anyone under 10 years of age. And then you can see there, there's some significant anomalies across the different states and territories. Just finally, um, before we jump to the questions, we had a lot of questions around what PPE should I be wearing during an outbreak? And this is a, just a cheat document that APNA has designed in collaboration with the Victorian Department of Health and Black Buck Doctors um, in regards to um, COVID-19 and PPE um, when you've got transmission risk. And as Suzanne's already said, we're gonna share this um, presentation after. So, um, you'll have that. But just a reminder that you do need to be wearing the appropriate PPE when you are vaccinating based on your current trans transmission or risk in your state or territory. So for instance, Victoria currently is at peak, so they are black, so they should be wearing full PPE to vaccinate, which includes their N95 or P2 mask. And then that opens another can of worms around fit testing or fit checking of those masks. So again, comes back to your systems and processes and making sure that you're following all of those. But I can't stress enough, APNA and the Infection Prevention Helpline, if you're in Victoria, are here to help you with all of these processes. So please uh, reach out to us and we are willing to, to give you some guidance. I think that's it for me, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks so much. We'll bring all our panellists back on. We're going to hit um, your questions. I acknowledge that we've gone a little bit over time. Um, we just really wanted to make sure we got all the critical information in. So we'll launch into your questions. Um, the most upvoted question so far is around getting those extra doses out of um, the Pfizer vials. Uh, we did cover a little bit of that in the presentation, but um, from some of you who are on the panel tonight who are giving this vaccine, my understanding is that there's a few things that this is dependent on. So if it's been reconstituted correctly, if you're using low dead space equipment, there's a fair chance you will get the extra dose out of the vial. Um, but often at the moment with constraints around what equipment you can get from government and from your medical supplies, you might not be using low dead space equipment. So it's unlikely that you would get that extra dose. Um, and I guess, you know, we need to also point out that if that there's no mixing of vials to, to get an extra dose if there's a bit left in. Has anyone else got any experience with that and want to add to that? I, I will, because I've answered a lot of inquiries and 
<clears throat> and taking this up to the department. There have been a number of cases where um, <clears throat> the dead space in the syringes hasn't been filled and people have been underdosed. There was one large case a couple of um, a few weeks ago in Queensland where they actually had to call people back to be revaccinated. And I think the main thing is that you have your 0.3 in the syringe with the dead space filled. Not every practice gets the low dead space syringes and it's a 0.01 to 0.03 difference in the dead space. So point, sorry, 0.003, that's a 10% of a dose difference. So you really need to not worry about squeezing an extra dose out. If you can, that's fantastic. But most importantly, you need to make sure that you're giving the correct dose and that the dead space is filled um, so that the patient gets the actual volume of the dose. Brilliant, thank you. Um, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes, you can. And if you watch the podcast um, uh, after this uh, gets looked in podcast format, if you watch it from the website, you'll get the slideshow at the same time. Um, spacing for vaccines post-COVID infection. It, the education state six months. Is it any different for people that have had one vaccine, then been infected with COVID and are now cleared? Um, Ginny, this might be one for you. So NCS has said you can wait up to six months before you get your second dose. We don't have really good guidance around that, but the CDC in um, America, so that's the Centers for Disease Control, have said that as soon as somebody is symptom-free, they can um, safely have their second vaccine. Um, so that's a, a reassuring thing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, is congenital heart conditions a contraindication for Pfizer? I guess this is no. around the myocarditis, pericarditis? No, it's not. Um, so if they have had um, pericarditis and myocarditis within the six months, within the last six months, we normally like them just to get signed off by um, a doctor, often a cardiologist, just to make sure that they can have another one. But if it's been more than six months, um, they can safely have it. Same, and most of the cardiologists that I'm sending my patients to are saying, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, same thing with um, if they've got congenital heart disease, if they've had a heart attack, absolutely no problem. Go for it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, lost my spot. Here we go. Uh, interesting question, and this is one we hear on their support line a bit too. Some clarity around whether or not we should be doing um, spirometry testing. Um, in general practice, I think this is um, at looking at. Now, the person who's popped this question in is currently in WA. Now, there's no COVID, or well, not much COVID happening in WA at the moment. Um, what's the best advice around spirometry and in different places and at diff with different COVID um, numbers in the community? Um, I could make a quick comment about that. And it is a very often asked question. There has been some changes that National Asthma um, the handbook has some advice in there. Absolutely do not use a nebulizer. And a lot of general practices still use nebulizers. Absolutely do not use a nebulizer. If you do go ahead um, with Ventolin in a space, so you need to make sure that your mask start, you need to take proper precautions. But the advice is probably that that should be done in a room with sort of negative pressure air and um but yeah i think that asthma handbook and jenny um would you so add to I'm, that? yeah so um my practice nurses are taking we are owned by a very large adelaide based um a group of uh, uh GP clinics and the head nurse there has said absolutely not to um, spirometry. So we are not doing spirometry and I've not been able to find any guidelines to back that up. Um, and it has been quite difficult because there are certain patients you just can't diagnose. And then that becomes a problem if you want to prescribe preventers or if you want to um, see how they're responding to a medication or create their school asthma action plan. It is really difficult, but we have not been doing it. And that's come from above from um, our head nurse. I, I might also... Information. 
from the IPC helpline. It's something that we get very commonly. So we do have some evidence around this. So I'm happy to share that, Suzanne, with the post um, workshop resources. Um, but certainly it's a no-go. Uh, and yeah, if you are doing it, it needs to be very well ventilated, full PPE. Um, and the, the recommendation is your um, 1.5 metres at least, but preference is no. So there's a comment just popped in the box from the lovely Judy Wicking, who is uh, an asthma nurse consultant and worked for um, uh, Asthma Australia. And she's put in the advice uh, in, the, in the chat box, Australian Asthma Handbook and also the TSA and Z on the recommendation guidelines. And don't forget the APNA COVID page. So we've got some links to um, the Australian Asthma Council around spirometry and um, lots of inf useful information on that page. Um, and, you know, you can contact um, those peak bodies um, if you've got questions that are really specific to the geographical area where you live and what's happening outbreak-wise where you live. Uh, another question about drawing up. So Pfizer's um, good for six hours um, once it's mixed, but what about when drawn up in a syringe? Sarah? Yeah, so six hours, as long as it is kept in cold chain between two and eight. So if you've got your vaccine out on a bench in an opaque container, it can stay out for an hour at, and it needs to be in an arm in that hour, but uh, six hours if it's in the fridge between two and eight. Even if it's drawn up in a syringe, yep. we're cool with that? Yep. Great. Make awesome. sure it's labelled. You do need to make sure your syringes are labelled with the vaccine, the time it was drawn and time to discard. Got to have yeah. all those details on it. Yeah, patient safety always. Hey, yeah. okay, um, Ginny, um, this is might be one that you can enlighten us on around viral load. Does the viral load change with different vaccines? So I guess is that the question's asking? Do some vaccines have better or lesser effect on viral load if someone's vaccinated and then they do become infected? It's such a great question. The answer is we don't know. So that study that came out of the wedding in Massachusetts, they didn't take data on who had had what vaccine, although AstraZeneca is not given in the United States at all. They only have the Moderna, the Pfizer and the Johnson & Johnson, the Janssen one. Um, but we've only just started looking at quantifying viral load, which is quite expensive to do. And um, so watch this space. We don't know. Okay. I think this is another one of those watch this space questions. but. Um, you touched briefly on boosters. Do we have any indication on the optimal time from dose two to giving boosters? So UK is doing six months. Um, the US has announced eight months. None of it is evidence-based. We don't have those studies that support it. Uh, we're doing a live um, study in Israel where it does look like as soon as you get that booster, your risk of getting symptomatic disease goes down. Um, but we don't know. And we don't even know whether there is any value in a 30-year-old having a booster. We just don't know. And so um, uh, my understanding, my reading of the TGA and ATAGI is that it's far more conservative and I can't see them rushing into a guidance on boosters. I can't see us getting that guidance this year. And um, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens next year. But I, I don't think we will be getting boosters for everybody, um, I, I'll be very surprised and we'll be watching the data that comes out. Yeah, and Apna's keeping an eye on this information as it comes from government, from uh, TAGI, from the Department of Health, from the Ministries of Health and um, from the TGA. So if new information becomes available, you'll find it at the top of the key information box on the Apna COVID page. So keep an eye on that every now and again and see if there's anything new there that you might have missed. Um, here's a, a great scenario question um, to go to all of you on the panel who are giving vaccine at the moment. If a pre-drawn syringe of the Pfizer is accidentally dropped, needle cap remains intact. My understanding is that this should not be administered as the lipid bubble may have been disrupted. Should syringes be discarded? Is this correct? Thankfully, this hasn't happened to me. So that, uh, <laughs> that nurse is uh, asking for a friend. So we yeah. have... The, the vaccines are, 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 can be quite susceptible to damage, can't they? Yeah, they can. And that's why, obviously, we don't tap or knock, you know, the vaccines. Um, in that situation, I'd be more worried about infection control than anything else. 
Um, so just from an infection control perspective, I would be saying it should automatically be discarded, um, let alone, you know, the damage that you may have done to any vaccine. Uh, and, you know, we can't forget the principles of infection prevention and control in this scenario. And, and we have seen some slips in that, unfortunately, through mass vaccination. Um, so, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Another um, infection prevention um, question, Sarah. In Victoria, PPE for vaccinating, full PPE for vaccinating, is that the current guidance? Yes. The current guidelines is you are at peak, which is black. And on that slide that I was showing, it is full PPE. Okay. We're hand, changing of gloves and hand hygiene between every patient as well. Okay, we're going to do a couple more questions and then um, we're just going to give you some information on the next lot of webinars coming up. So hang on there. Uh, um, children, uh, well, do we know if children under 12 will be getting vaccinated in the future? So the studies are happening at the moment, um, both for Pfizer and for Moderna. Um, and they were meant, uh, Pfizer had announced to the stock market that they were going to the, um, the FDA, the um, Food and Drug Administration in the United States in September. However, their numbers were too small. And because of the risk of the myocarditis, pericarditis, the FDA sent them packing and said, get bigger numbers and then come back. Um, they're looking for really more accurate data around the risk of that rare blood, um, heart disease. So we don't have really good data, but let's say they go to the FDA, um, they'll probably get emergency provision because that's how they do it in the United States. Um, they'll do it fairly quickly. We in Australia are much slower. So we have not been doing emergency provisions. We've been going through th full TGA approval process. So I would say whatever happens in the US, it'll be several months before we see it in, the, in, in Australia. So probably sometime early next year is my guess. So be sure to earmark and save the date of October 6, 2021 in your diaries so you can watch live the next edition of APNA's webinar series. That one will showcase shingles prevention and immunization. And in order to keep up with the latest news in primary healthcare, please don't forget to subscribe to APNA's weekly newsletter, The Connect. There is a link dropped in the show notes of this episode for your convenience. And last but not least, if you are listening to this episode of the Nursing Australia podcast right now on your favorite podcast listening app, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button and or click to follow. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe out there and please look after each other. Thank you so much for joining us on Nursing Australia. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. For more information, please visit us at www.apna.asn.au. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia.